911. Where is your emergency? Uh, yes, Meadow Run Drive in Skillman, New Jersey. In September 2014, a crime on a suburban cul-de-sac shocks New Jersey's political world. The mystery deepens over the death of John and Joyce Sheridan, a prominent New Jersey couple with powerful connections and close friends of Governor Chris Christie. And you're listening to some excerpts from a very popular podcast. The whole nation's actually listening to it. It's called Dead End, and it's about political intrigue in New Jersey. Shockingly, political intrigue in New Jersey. It shouldn't be a headline, but there's a story here, a bigger story. It's about John Sheraton and his wife, Joyce, who were killed back in 2014. I think it has been declared a murder, although an unsolved mystery in the annals of the state. This podcast really delves into the entire background of the murder, of the different questions that have remained unanswered. And I bring in the panel today. Let's set the stage about John Sheridan for people who are listening to this podcast who don't really know the history. So who was John Sheridan and why is his story so fascinating to so many people? John Sheridan was a Republican who was well-respected on both sides of the aisle. He headed up the Transportation Department under Governor Kane. At the time of his death, he was the CEO of Cooper Health, one of the largest health services corporations in the state of New Jersey. When he died in 2014, along with his wife, Joyce Sheridan, it was at the time ruled as a murder-suicide. And at first, people were like, no, this can't be. You know, John Sheridan's this incredibly well-respected guy. Tons of people went to his funeral all during his life. A true bipartisan person who wanted the best for New Jersey. But then the aspects of his death were particularly horrific. The idea was that Sheridan, according to the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office, had stabbed and killed his wife and then stabbed and killed itself. And then somehow the house went on fire as some way to destroy evidence. Again, this does not fit the profile for what people thought of John Sheridan. So Mark Sheridan, who is an attorney and one of the four sons of the Sheridans, basically started his own investigation. He's like, you know, we can't possibly believe this to be true. And what he found out was more and more disturbing. They hired their own forensic expert who came in and said, you know, a lot of these things don't match up, you know, in terms of this potentially being a murder-suicide, him potentially killing himself with his own knife. There was a question also of the knife itself used to kill John Sheridan that it didn't match up as the knife that potentially killed him. As a result of his efforts over time, it was not ruled as a suicide anymore. It was ruled as, you know, undetermined cause. Adding further intrigue to this is that recently a Democratic operative in New Jersey, Sean Cattle, pled guilty to arranging the murder of a Michael Galdieri. He'd been a Hudson County political operative in very similar circumstances. Galdieri was stabbed to death. And then let's set the place on fire to get rid of all evidence. And it was the same year as the charity. Right. Murder. It only happened four months after the Sheridan murders. Brendan, the Sheridan, they were Republicans, but they were also well known to both parties. And three governors, I think, signed the letter requesting that the investigation be reopened after the initial finding that it was a murder-suicide. Yeah, I mean, I did not know Mr. Sheridan, but, um, you know, from by all accounts, he was uh, a well-respected uh, public servant, uh, you know, who served uh, uh, under Governor Kane, served in other various governmental positions. His son is a very well-known attorney, active in Republican Party politics for many years. So if you were involved in New Jersey government, you know, the Sheridan name and the Sheridan family was a name that either you knew personally or you were uh, aware of, you know, through your involvement in public service. It's very tragic, obviously, what happened to Joyce and John Sheridan, not only to have this tragic murder happen to your family, but to the failure of government to investigate this. What the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office did in, you know, just destroying evidence and it was just a completely botched investigation was horrible and terrible. And the Sheridan family themselves had to pursue their own justice. And then the state's attorney general's office de declined to investigate. It's my hope now that the state attorney general, Matt Placken, under Governor Murphy, is reopening the investigation. And I also believe that the FBI with the strong cattle case coming to light has now decided to investigate. So I really hope they, they do get justice. For full disclosure, I did review this podcast for the Best Evidence Newsletter. This is actually my favorite kind of case because this is not just about a murder-suicide and a mystery. It's my favorite because it tells us more about what goes on in New Jersey. It is an educational moment for New Jersey because we've got two big things people are learning by learning about this case. Number one is about what goes on in the Camden waterfront. As always in New Jersey, what the scandal is not what's illegal, but what is legal. And the fact that, you know, when you've got developer, you know, George Norcross, 
on the waterfront who's able to basically have monopoly on what goes on, on the waterfront uh, is shocking. So let's introduce our viewers to George Norcross, those of us that have yeah. not So heard of him. in New Jersey, we still work very much on a political boss system, and George Norcross is the acknowledged political boss of South Jersey on the Camden waterfront. He controls the state money that goes down there for the redevelopment of Camden. We can argue about how successful or unsuccessful that has been. And he's a power broker down there. He controls a lot of money, he funds candidates, and he's able to control people and get his way. But through a combination of money and his reputation, and people don't want to get in his wrong, on the wrong side of him. And just for the record, so John Sheridan's last job was as was, CEO of was the working Cooper for, Medical Center? Was working Center? for and Cooper Medical Center is one of the bases of uh, Norcross's power. So people learning about that is necessarily a good thing. The way New Jersey politics works, you know, and Norcross is a big power player in that, although he's been damaged in recent years. Thank you guys for setting the table. You're going to hear from Nancy Solomon in just a minute. She's the reporter who created this podcast. She reported on it. We're excited to have her and we'll be right back. It has taken six months in all, but now the Somerset County prosecutor says the Cooper Health CEO, John Sheridan, did in fact kill his wife, Joyce, before stabbing himself and setting the couple's bedroom on fire. This news left me with more questions than it answered. What could have been going on in their lives that would have caused this highly regarded 72-year-old to kill his wife of 47 years? We're back now, as promised, with Nancy Solomon. She's a senior reporter at WNYC Public Radio in New York, New Jersey resident, and very famous of late, having narrated, reported, and produced this amazing podcast, Dead End, which we just talked about, the story of the murders of John and Joyce Sheridan. And I think a lot of people watching this have listened to the podcast and probably just want to know what inspired you to do it. Uh, what inspired me? I think what inspired me was um, two things. Uh, first... I had been working on an investigative journalism project in 2019 that was about land deals on the Camden waterfront, about the corporate tax break program in New Jersey, and the political machine in South Jersey. And I came upon the connection that John Sheridan, who was murdered in 2014, had to all of those issues in that deal. And in 2019, when I produced a bunch of stories about all that stuff, it was very sort of like investigative, document driven, a little dry, you know, when you try to get people to like pay attention to tax breaks and real estate deals and the political machine even can be a little hard. So I was frustrated that those stories didn't quite have the kind of legs that I would like them to have. And then when I found out that John Sheridan had a connection to all of this, that was like a tickle in my brain that I couldn't let go of. And I just kept wondering about it and thinking about it. And I had been aware of the murders of John and Joyce Sheridan from 2014. I'd been covering and coordinating our coverage of New Jersey. And I think, you know, every political reporter in the state was very curious and following along with that investigation. And so it was kind of a combination of my interest in the Sheridan case and my interest in what had gone on in Camden and John Sheridan's connection to it. And then I had this idea that I'm a bit of a true crime podcast junkie. And I like TV series about detectives and murder mysteries and books. And so I had this idea, well, if I could tell the story as part of a murder mystery, maybe I could engage people and, and take them along for the ride into the deep dive into political corruption uh, and this real estate deal and all of that. And, um, you know, so that's really where it all came from. And it is a murder mystery. You didn't have to stretch it. I mean, it clearly is real life murder mystery. Yes, absolutely. Murder mystery, a cold case. It's been almost eight years since John and Joyce Sheridan were found in their bedroom dead. And it's just curious to anybody who pays attention that this was not a case that uh, had more resources put into it. Why wasn't it looked at? Why wasn't it investigated more deeply? The local detectives at the time made a very quick decision that it was a murder-suicide. And that just didn't sit right with anybody who knew the Sheridans. I interviewed former Governor Christine Todd Whitman, who never believed for a second that that's what happened. And she knew them personally. Because we were still in those throes of, this is just impossible. The theories they're putting out there, what happened, this was just not the John and Joyce any of us knew. 
So there were a lot of powerful people in New Jersey who did not believe the murder-suicide theory, yet the Attorney General's office never got involved. When you started to unspool all of this in the podcast and you told the story of the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office and how they investigated it, I think anyone listening to it sort of found like, wow, that just seems so unrealistic, but how could they have been so bad? Right. I mean, they were accusing a man of murdering his wife and then killing himself, and they never talked to Joyce Sheridan's best friend. They didn't talk to one of their closest neighbors. That in and of itself didn't make sense. As a person just listening to the reporting on it when it first happened, it was kind of, it was one of those things where you're like, what? John Sheridan was found stabbed to death underneath a large wooden armoire that was on fire. That's a suicide? Like that just didn't, didn't make sense. What was the critical evidence for you that made you think that so many mistakes were made? There were many. Mm -hmm. A second autopsy was conducted and the knife that killed John Sheridan was not found on the scene. There was a spatter of blood sprayed at the top of the stairwell outside their bedroom that indicates by all accounts that a confrontation happened there. So if you're gonna kill your wife and then kill yourself, do you go stand at the top of your stairs to stick a knife into yourself? Like it just, that doesn't make sense. There was a fire poker that the detectives didn't take into evidence, didn't do any analysis on, that was upstairs in the bedroom that belonged downstairs and John Sheridan had lateral thin bruises across his chest and five broken ribs and a chipped tooth. Those were the major ones. And then ultimately I found a deposition in a whistleblower suit that was filed by the guy who had the most forensic experience on that local uh, detective force that's run by Somerset County. And he was away at a conference at the time of the murder and he was gone that whole week teaching about forensic science, uh, ironically. And when he came back, he saw what a poor job had been done and he was already frustrated that his detectives in that office were making mistakes before this. And then he sees what happened with the Sheridan case. He complains, he's demoted. He files a whistleblower complaint, and in the depositions to that case, I was able to really kind of get, you know, the narrative story of what was going on inside that we didn't know about the ways that there was a history of mistakes and carelessness in that department. My sense of what happened is, and I think the deposition really bears this out, they made a, a, a quick decision about what they thought happened, and then they only saw what they believed, and they didn't really look any further. And then once they were criticized for it, then they just doubled down and insisted for years that, it, that they had done the right thing. It's understandable, people make mistakes. I don't think there was anything intentional about it, except that they weren't willing to really back up and redo the investigation and take a harder look at what they had done. I think more questions are raised by the state attorney general's office not getting involved. To me, that's the piece of this that really needs more uh, investigation and more analysis to really understand why that agency is not doing the kind of work that we need them to do as you know as residents of the state and that's one of the subjects of one of the podcasts is what they actually were set up for intended to do and what they haven't done in just in general terms not just in in this case so eight years have gone by or nearly eight years how does that impact the ability to get an accurate resolution to this from everything i've been told by the people whose this is their profession former police detectives um, uh, and current police detectives uh, that this is going to be a very hard case to solve. It's possible, but the crime scene was not processed well. Evidence was not taken. And, you know, as the founder of the Division of Criminal Justice at the Attorney General's office said, uh, they messed up the crime scene so badly that it's going to be very difficult for anyone else to come in and do a decent job of it. So there's that. But the Sheridan family, the four sons, were able to preserve some evidence. I mean, when they, the house was turned back over to them and they found just this horrible scene in their, in their parents' home and there was no fingerprint dust. There was evidence that appeared to be evidence just strewn about in the bedroom. So they were able to actually take some of those things and preserve them and keep them. So, you know, I think there is some reasonable hope that maybe some DNA testing can be done on what they do have. And, you know, cold cases do get solved on occasion. So, I, you know, I, I'm hopeful that 
something could be done. Well, in the middle of reporting this, something really important happened. There was the discovery that a political consultant in Hudson County had confessed to setting up or arranging a murder of a fellow political consultant, a murder that occurred the same year and that had some of the same earmarks of the murder of the Sheridans. And when we come back, we'll talk to Nancy Solomon more about how that changed her story and what you've heard on the podcast. We'll be right back. Back now with Nancy Solomon, who's a senior reporter at WNYC and the producer, reporter behind the podcast you may have heard about called Dead End, the story of the John and Joyce Sheridan murders, a deep investigative eight parts. In the middle of reporting this, what happens? So in late January of this year, 2022, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Newark, so that's a federal prosecutor, uh, releases information that they have charged a political consultant in New Jersey with a murder for hire scheme in which this political consultant named Sean Cattle hired two men to go and kill a guy who sometimes has been called a political operative in Jersey City, Michael Galderi. He's a guy who'd get hired to like hand out leaflets or put up signs or that sort of thing. He's not like a high level political operative in any kind of way. He was the son of a former state senator and he turned up dead in late May, could have been the last days of May or the first days of June of 2014. And Sean Cattle pleaded guilty to hiring these two hitmen, paying them to kill Michael Galdieri. And what interested me and many other reporters in New Jersey was the proximity and the resemblance of the MO of this crime to the Sheridan case. The Sheridans were murdered at the end of September of 2014, and they were stabbed to death and their bedroom was set on fire. And in Jersey City, the victim was stabbed to death and his apartment set on fire. And these are four months apart. And most intriguing, we learn, the Sheridans were murdered Saturday night into Sunday morning. And on the Monday, George Brett Sennis, one of the hitmen, supposedly, was pulled over and arrested for a carjacking and a bank robbery in Connecticut. And in his car was a kitchen knife. And a kitchen knife was one of the weapons in the Sheridan murders. There were two kitchen knives found in the bedroom. They were taken from the Sheridan's kitchen. There was a missing kitchen knife that was never found. And there's been no word from the FBI which got handed this case. The bank robbery case was an FBI case because bank robberies are federal crime. So that's just an intriguing fact that has yet to go anywhere, but may turn out to be significant. But so far, there's been no word whether or not that knife has been tested, whether there was blood on it, whether there was DNA on it, or whether it matches the set in the Sheridan home. Maybe the FBI knows that all those things are not true, but we haven't heard anything. They haven't said anything publicly about it. And this has all sort of triggered the state attorney general to take another look at this case, to reopen it, if you will, and probably due to your investigation and due to the surfacing of the, this confession and the similar crime, correct? Yeah. I mean, what I know about that is very limited. The technical term is superseded. So from day one, going back to 2014, The attorney general's office always had the ability to take over this investigation. And the Sheridan family, which is a very well-connected political family, asked for the attorney general to do that multiple times and never got any satisfaction. Now we have a new attorney general, Matt Platkin, and he has superseded the case. And what that means is they, I believe, they get all the files from Somerset County. Somerset County just sort of gives up the case turns it over, and now we have the Division of Criminal Justice, which was built to deal with complicated, difficult cases that need an expert detective unit to solve. It is now in their hands. What they're doing with it, I I do know they've contacted some of the people that I know that I had interviewed for the podcast. That's how I learned that they had opened the case. But what they're doing with it exactly, all we know is that they've confirmed that, yes, they are investigating. Uh, Whether they were motivated by the Sean Cattle case, whether they were motivated by the public attention from the podcast, 
I do not know. And we really haven't even talked about it, but the elephant in the room on this, the connection that John Sheridan had in Camden to the Norcross political machine and the conflict that was going on at that time during the redevelopment of the waterfront purchase of a building there. In all, you know, fairness, that hasn't been called into question as, a, you know, motivation for this. It's just sort of floating out there. But how does that sort of factor into your story? I know you told it. You had previously investigated, as you said um, earlier, but... How does that factor in now, if at all? I think it's, it's something that needs to be looked at. And that is the most important thing, I think, to understand about it, is that it's, a, it's an intriguing uh, paper trail that should be followed. John Sheridan was the CEO of Cooper University Hospital. The chairman of that hospital is George Norcross. George Norcross is a political boss who runs a very effective, the most effective and most powerful political machine in New Jersey. The night that John and Joyce Sheridan were murdered, there were documents sitting on the dining room table. And those documents are a clear attempt by John Sheridan to document and create a paper paper trail of a dispute that was happening between a nonprofit developer in Camden, of which he served as a volunteer as the chairman of their board. Because as CEO of the hospital, he was very involved in redevelopment of Camden and trying to make improvements in Camden. That was really his mission. He's not a medical guy who was there to run a hospital per se, but the hospital is the largest employer in Camden, and his goal was to try to help the city. So he worked with this nonprofit. The nonprofit had a deal to buy a building at a very good price and this is a complicated thing that's related to the new tax breaks that have come into law at that point making property in Camden more valuable than it had been and George Norcross and his brother Phil intervene in that sale and basically muscle their way in and force the nonprofit which they have no official connection to to give up the sale and the papers on the dining room table basically walk you through that entire conflict that is happening in March, April, and May of 2014. Yet none of that was mentioned or studied by the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office and really hasn't been tied to anything. No, and Mark Sheridan, one of the Sheridan sons, when he saw those documents and he went through them and he looked at them, he brought those documents to the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office. He brought those documents to the Attorney General and nothing was ever done. Well, we're going to leave it here because we could just keep talking, Nancy. But there are eight parts to this podcast, which I strongly suggest. Even if you're not a podcast aficionado, you live in New Jersey, you should listen to this because there's a lot of background, too, about how the state operates. It's very interesting. It's called Dead End. Nancy Solomon from WNYC. Keep us posted on this, okay? You. If you have more episodes that you're going to drop or you break the case. If something happens, we will definitely put out more. All right. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Doctor. Have a great day.